Good morning. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reform Presbyterian Church as we gather together to worship the Lord our God. And as we begin this morning, a few announcements to make. Uh, we uh, restarted our uh, Sabbath school this morning. Uh, we met at 10 o'clock. And uh, one announcement from that that you know, just one of them things that you know, I didn't think of until uh, Ian reminded me of it this morning. Um, we are going to be taking up the Sabbath school uh, offering uh, on uh, during Sabbath school. Uh, so uh, next week we'll, we'll start that up. Um, but again, uh, we do invite y'all to come for, for Sabbath school at 10 o'clock. Again, the adults are meeting down here and the and kids are meeting up in their uh, classrooms. Also, um, on December 20th, uh, we will be uh, filling up uh, the uh, Christmas baskets. And uh, just as a, a reminder on that one, slight change from the announcement in your bulletin, uh, seven of them are going to get filled here at the church. And the eighth one, for Mr. Garland, because of the restrictions at Wellmore, uh, we have to kind of give him a pre-packaged uh, one. But uh, please uh, feel free to bring cards uh, for Mr. Garland for that uh, package. And as well, go, you know, obviously feel free to send them uh, any time. And to any of our shut-ins, I know all of them love hearing from y'all. So if you have a moment, uh, feel free to give them a holler. Um, but uh, if you can, please uh, bring the items for that, uh, for those uh, Christmas baskets before church on the 20th. If you have any questions about that, uh, please talk either with uh, Miss, Miss Pam or Miss Susan uh, or Miss Karen uh, about uh, any information on that. Also, uh, the Angel Tree gifts are due here at the church uh, by Thursday, December 10th. So if you signed up to help with the Angel Tree, just uh, keep that in mind. Uh, uh, also, next Sunday after morning worship, we'll have our annual congregational meeting. Uh, as is our kind of normal process with that, we will, uh, after the benediction, take kind of a five-minute little break, and uh, then we will constitute uh, the court for the congregational meeting. And if you haven't gotten a copy of the, uh, the budget, there's still a few of them floating around, so feel free to grab of one of those. And if you have any questions about that, uh, please let me know. Also, one, one last thing. Uh, this quarter, we are taking up a special offering for Camp Joy, which is our uh, special needs camp that the ARP operates. And so please uh, give uh, to that as we continue to support that wonderful mission. And as we begin to worship this morning, let us do so as we prepare ourselves through prayer. Amen. One last announcement I've got to announce. Uh, the session will meet tonight at, at 5 o'clock uh, here at the church. And as we begin our worship today, let us turn to our call to worship uh, from Zephaniah at chapter 3 uh, as we read verses 8 and 9. Again, let us hear the word of our Lord as we are called to worship in his grace. Again, Zephaniah chapter 3, beginning there at verse 8. Therefore, Wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation on all fierce anger, all the earth to be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. Amen. As we hear once more of the blessings of the calling together of the people of the, Lord of, uh, of the Lord our God, let us stand as we rejoice together singing a Bible song number nine 
uh, Psalm 5, as we sing together the blessings of the Lord, as Jehovah has heard our words, and let us be attentive to his call. Let us stand, let us rejoice, and let us sing together. up unto the heavens themselves as we are blessed in every way with the presence of our holy and our righteous God. Let us come now before this selfsame God as we bring our prayers to him. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you are the God over all things. You are the God of heaven and of earth. You have called all people to submit themselves unto you, to hear your sovereign call, to repent of their sins, to come and to rest in the garden of your grace. And God, we pray through the power of your certain word that this morning that we will come to offer mercy, we will come to offer our love unto you, and that we will do so knowing that though we are sinners, though we have fallen far short of your glory, we rest not in the works of the flesh, but in the perfect righteousness of Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, our Redeemer and our Sustainer, and the One who has given unto us, through the Holy Spirit, new life in Himself. Dear God, may we treasure this gift, and may we rejoice in the blessings of Your covenant love. Dear God, we gather now, saying the words Your Son taught His disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we give thanks again for God's blessing and his holy word, we turn to our scripture reading this morning, which comes to us once more from 2 Samuel. We read chapter 16, uh, verses 1 to 14, as we hear here of Mephibosheth and of Shimei. Let us turn to the word of our God as we are blessed again once more through the reading of God's book. Hear the word of the Lord. When David was a little past the top of the mountain, there was Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, who met him with a couple of saddle donkeys, and on them two hundred loaves of bread, one hundred clusters of raisins, one hundred summer fruits, and a skin of wine. 
And the king said to Ziba, what do you mean to do with these? So Ziba said, the donkeys are for the king's household to ride on, the bread and the summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine for those who are faint in the wilderness to drink. Then the king said, and where is your master's son? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he is staying in Jerusalem. For he said, today the house of Israel will restore the kingdom of my father to me. The king said to Ziba, Here all that belongs to Mephibosheth is yours. And Ziba said, I humbly bow before you that I might may find favor in your sight, my lord, O king. Now when King David came to Baharum, there was a man from the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera, coming from there. He came out cursing continuously as he came. And he threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men who were on his right hand and on his left. Also Shimei said this when he cursed, Come out, come out, you bloodthirsty man, you rogue. The Lord has brought upon all you all the blood of the house of Saul in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, your son. So now you are caught in your own evil because you are a bloodthirsty man. And Abishai, the son of Zeruah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Please, let me go over and take off his head. The king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruah? So let him curse, because the Lord has said to him, Curse David. Who then shall say, Why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and all his servants, See how my son, who came to my own body, seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjamin? Let him alone, let him curse. And so the Lord has ordered him. It may be that the Lord will look on my affliction and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing this day. And as David and his men went along the road, Shimei went along the hillside opposite him and cursed as he went, threw stones at him and kicked up dust. Now the king and all the people who were with him became weary, so they refreshed themselves there. Amen. Thanks be to God for the reading of his holy and his perfect word. Let us now be seated. I invite the children to come up for the lesson. Good morning. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. How are y'all doing today? Good. Good. Y'all enjoying this cold weather? No. <laughs> I hear a smatter in the nose and yeses. What do you like about cold weather? Snow. Snow? Well, I'm not sure we're going to get a whole lot of that. We, uh, we don't exactly live at the right latitude for a lot of snow. Maybe the Lord will bless us with uh, maybe a, a dusting or so. You know, you know the beautiful thing about living down here about snow? You, you get to watch it on the television, and that's a good place for it, right? Nope. No. <laughs> well, let, we're going to talk about something today uh, that can seem a little strange. In our scripture passage, we're going to hear about aliens. Now, what do you think of when you hear the word aliens? Area 51. Area 51? Huh, I know what you've been watching on YouTube. <laughs> what the, huh? What else do you think of? Right? For little green men. UFOs. UFOs, right? People you know, from space, we don't know where they came from. Right, people from space, we don't know where they came from, right? Well, do you think that's what the Bible's talking about when it talks about aliens? No. no. Like people who don't come from the area around. That's right. Yeah, the, when the Bible talks about aliens, especially in the passage we're in today, is talking about people who aren't from Israel. You know, people who are strangers to the covenant that God made. Now, anybody know what a covenant is? A pact. Well, a pact, right? What else is a covenant? A holy agreement. Right, a holy agreement, right? It's a, an agreement between God and his people. Now, in the Old Testament... God made that covenant with who? Abraham. 
Joseph. With Abraham, right? With Joseph, right? With, with, with the sons of Abraham, right? They were the covenant people of God. Now, in the New Testament, who gets to be a part of that covenant family? Everyone, right? Now, is that because God's decided he doesn't like Jews anymore and now he just likes Gentiles? No. No, right? What, what is the, the covenant being made with all people tell us about God? He's loving. That's right. He's a loving God, right? He's merciful. Right? He's taken those of us, right? Now, are any of y'all from Israel? No. 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 Are any of your parents from Israel? No. No, right? You all are what the Bible calls Gentiles, right? Now, we come from Europe and from Asia and from Africa, right? We're not from Israel. We're aliens to the covenant, to the commonwealth, as the Bible will call it. But God has had mercy upon the Gentiles, and what has he done? Right? He saved us, right? He's redeemed us. He has made us members of his kingdom, right? His commonwealth, his country. And so we who were once strangers, we who were once aliens are now what? We're citizens of the kingdom. Right? We've been brought in to the kingdom. Now, what, what should be our response to that? What should we tell God about his bringing us into the kingdom? We're happy. Right? We're happy, right? You know, what else should we be? Grateful, right? Thankful to the Lord. And, and what's one of the things we do on Sunday morning? Go to come church. To church. We come to church, right? And what do we do at church? Worship, right? worship, right? And so in worship, we are giving thanks to God. Right? We're praising Him for taking us who were aliens and making us citizens of His kingdom. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Absolutely. So I want to make sure when we come and sing here in a second, that y'all sing with joy. And praise him in thanksgiving for this wonderful grace. Y'all ready to do that with me? All right. Well, I want to hear y'all's voices. Right, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the joy of coming into your kingdom, of the blessing of being aliens and now citizens of your commonwealth. And God, we pray that we will be grateful and thankful for this wonderful work of your grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we hear once more in this blessing, we are told of the goodness of God in the sending of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we stand and sing uh, hymn number 201, and we sing of this blessing of Bethlehem, let's remember that this holy child who has come unto us is the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has died for our sins on the cross. We have been raised in his blessings. Let us stand, let us sing with that joy in our heart. With that thanksgiving on our lips, so to stand and sing together.
Amen. Let us be seated. As we come now before our great and awesome God, as we bring the needs of our hearts, of our souls, of our families, our communities, and our nation, and this world before the Lord our God, let us prepare ourselves to be in His presence. Let us pray. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who has prepared the way, the coming of your only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. Unto you, dear God, we gather together to sing praises this day. Unto you, dear God, we have our comfort and our peace. And in you alone, dear God, do we raise up our Ebenezer and make a stand for your gospel truth. On this day that you have made and declared holy, this day that you have given unto your covenant people that we might remember that glorious day when your Son was raised from the dead, the first fruits of our justification, the sign that you had accepted and received his full and sufficient sacrifice for our sin. God, on this glorious resurrection day, as we rest in the mercy of your love unto us, That our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did not forsake us nor forget us. But that he endured all things. That he endured the taking on of flesh, of being born in a manger. He took on all the revilings of his own family, of his own city in Nazareth. As he took on the doubts of the disciples and the uh, sins of the Pharisees and Sadducees and all of the evil of the age in which he came. God, he opened not his mouth, but went as a lamb to the slaughter, willingly for our transgressions. He might be again of that lamb which has been placed upon him. All of the sins that we have committed, the sin of Adam itself, the one who threw this world into chaos and uh, into darkness, even that great sin, dear God, which we bear upon ourselves as sons of Adam, the Lord Jesus paid the penalty and the debt that was owed of all sin that we might gather together this morning and praise your name. Dear God, may you make the truths of the gospel fresh unto us this morning. Dear God, may we never take for granted what an amazing work that Jesus Christ has undertaken and completed and won the victory over on our behalf. We who were Uh, not worthy of such a gift. God, may you again open our eyes to see the blessings of redemption. May you humble us before you this morning. Dear God, may we meditate on the ways that we do not give thanks for this wonderful gift the ways in which we transgress your holy commandments, that we turn aside to the idols of this age and the idols of our own hearts. God, may the cry of the Apostle Paul in Romans 7 be dear unto us. 
God, may we be honest with our own hearts that we struggle with sin, that we struggle with the old man within us. Dear God, it's in recognizing uh, this weakness that we see the strength we have alone in Jesus Christ. God, may on that solid rock we stand, both this day and forevermore. But dear God, especially as we go uh, through this life you've given to us, as we face struggles in our, uh, on our work, from day to day, as our employers or our bosses or uh, those who work for us, dear God, are a struggle to us, that may we rest and trust in you alone. May we rest and trust in your wisdom. May we rest and, and trust in grace and mercy. God, may we show the mercy that you've given to us, to those around us. May we not act out in wrath, but may we turn away wrath with love and with grace. Dear God, we live in such a time and in such a place where there is much reason for anger. There is good reason for righteous anger against those who are, uh, who are destroying what is good and what is right. Dear God, as we speak out against uh, those unrighteous things, God, may we remember the weapons that you've given to us. We wage war not as the world wages war, but we wage war with the weapons of the Spirit, with prayer, with the word of the living and the true God, and with that great and wonderful soul. Dear God, we place these things in your hands this morning. Dear God, even in the midst of turmoil and tribulation, we might show forth the light of our Savior. We might, in entering into these situations with the mind of Christ, might uh, show forth his goodness unto those who are enemies of the gospel, that they might be one with the word of the Spirit. Dear God, we pray that as we face uh, these times, dear God, uh, that you will send your Holy Spirit to speak unto our hearts. Dear God, again, we testify that we are not able to bear these things we are weak vessels. We are broken vessels. Dear God, you are more than sufficient for these things. Dear God, may we believe that truth, not just on the surface, but in the depths of our hearts. Again, dear God, we give thanks this morning that your Holy Spirit, which dwells within us, knows the depths of our hearts knows our needs even before we can recognize them ourselves and has already brought them into your presence. God, we give thanks for the blessings of being members of your covenant, of being those who have been adopted into the family of God, not by the works of the flesh, but by the very work of our Savior. Dear God, as we <coughs> meditate on these many and majestic attributes, and these many wonderful works that you've accomplished. God, we pray in your mercy that you would be with our nation and with our community. We pray, dear God, as you do continue to bring your judgment down upon this nation, that, dear God, out of the, the embers of your flame, we might see a purification of your church. We might see a body of Christ which comes out the other side stronger, not only in faith, but in power, willing once more to put aside all of the material things of this world. We put aside all of those things that really hold our trust and our love. And come together as one person, people, as one body in Christ, rejoicing with one another, bearing one another's burdens as the body of Christ. Dear God, we pray in these things, dear God, 
That as we hear of those who would close the churches of Christ on the Lord's Day, we pray for those who are standing boldly, willing to face the temporal consequences. God, we pray for their encouragement this morning. We pray, dear God, that your Holy Spirit would again lift them up. God, as we pray and continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ in Nigeria, continue to face the sword of Islam. We pray once more, dear God, that you will bring judgment down upon their captors and upon the enemies of truth. Dear God, we continue to ask in your mercy as we pray for their persecutors, dear God, is that you will bring them into the knowledge of your truth, that they will cast aside their idolatries and see the beauty of Jesus Christ as you did with Paul so many years ago. God, as we lift up these prayers and as we continue to worship you this morning, we pray, dear God, for the week ahead. We pray that you will continue to sanctify us in your grace. Continue to grow us to be more like Jesus Christ, to love the things that Christ loved to find our rest and our peace and our comfort in him alone. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we come uh, to our scripture lesson this morning, which comes to us uh, from the book of Ephesians once more, as we go to chapter 2 and we read verses 11 through 13. Let us stand and let us hear the word of our God. And hear the word of the Lord, Ephesians chapter 2, beginning there at verse 11. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for these words on this day. God, in your providence, as you have brought us to the words of Ephesians Chapter 2, we pray through the Holy Spirit that you will accomplish your work this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. You know, this time of year, our minds are often drawn to the Old Testament. Our minds are drawn to the promises that have been made about the Messiah. And really, the greatest of those promises is the fact for us that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. That Jesus Christ came to end the enmity between God and man. Because really what this season is about is about the fulfillment of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The promise that out of Eve would come a seed. And that seed would trample upon the head of the serpent. And by trampling upon the head of that serpent, his heel would be bruised. We hear those words. We refer to them in a similar way that Paul refers to them here in Ephesians chapter 2. That is a covenant of promise. The promise that God made to man that he would reconcile himself to us. For the seed of Eve. 
And that whole picture of the seed of Eve appears over and over again in the Old Testament. And we hear of the seed coming in the person of Seth. Now, of course, Seth is not Jesus. But Seth is a picture, a type of Christ. And we see that godly line go down through the centuries, through the years between Adam and the birth of Christ. It's one of the reasons why we have that great and wonderful genealogy in the Gospel of Luke. The testimony that from Adam has come the Son of God. That from Adam has come the one who would make all things new. On Sunday mornings in Sabbath school, we have started a new uh, uh, quarterly in the book of the prophet Isaiah. And of course, Isaiah is a wonderful place to go to see the promise of this seed continuing down upon the generations, upon the fulfillment of this covenant a promise made to Adam and to Eve. In Isaiah chapter 11 verse 10 it says, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. Now think of the language there of root. What is a root, right? A root is what's under the ground, right? It's the part you cannot see. Now sometimes you see them, right? Because they come up over the ground and you run them over with your lawnmower and tear up the blades on it. I know the deacons here have had to do that more than once with the uh, lawnmower here at the church because I don't pay a whole lot of attention when I'm cutting over there by the tennis courts. But the reality is, is these roots are what hold the tree up, right? The roots are what keep the tree from falling over in the wind. It's the roots where the trees really get their nourishment. And this picture of the root of Jesse is continued into the New Testament when we hear about the nature of the church and especially the calling of the Gentiles. It's not just in the Gospel of John where we see this root and the vine mentioned uh, so clearly. We also see it, for instance, in Romans chapter 11. There the Apostle Paul is dealing with what's going to happen to the Jews. He's concerned about his brothers in the flesh. And he wants the people in Rome and us to know that God has not forgotten his promises to the nation of Israel. That there will be a day in the future where Israel will be restored. Now that doesn't mean that nation that's over there in the Middle East. That's not what the promises are about. The promises of Romans 11 are about ethnic Israel. About the fleshly sons and daughters of Abraham. What is going to happen to them? And in Reminding the Gentiles that God still has a plan for ethnic Israel. He has this to say about the root and about the olive tree and about the nature of our place in the kingdom. In Romans chapter 11 verse 16 it says, For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. So again, where do we get our holiness from? We get it from the fact that we are a part of the vine, the true vine of which Jesus Christ is the root. Right, This root of Jesse who stands as a banner to the people. Right? He is holy, so we are holy. What does that mean for us as Gentiles? And if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. In our passage, as we read here in Ephesians chapter 2, as we hear of the aliens of the commonwealth, 
And we need to be reminded of the nature of our place in the kingdom, especially as Paul lays it out here in Romans 11. Right? Who are the natural branches of the holy tree? Right? The natural branches is ethnic Israel. It is the sons and daughters of Abraham. And what has happened to the ethnic Jews who have refused the call of the Messiah? Well, the scriptures tell us they have been broken off and thrown in the fire, right? They've been taken off that tree. And what have they been replaced with here in Romans 11? They've been replaced with the branches of the wild olive tree. And again, who is that? That's us. That's the Gentiles, those who are strangers to the covenant of promise. And we have been taken off that wild olive tree and we have been grafted into the holy tree whose root is the Lord Jesus Christ and we have become one with that tree. Now, if you do a good job of grafting uh, old branches onto a new tree, after a while, can you even tell the difference between that which was grafted on and that which is natural? Well, eventually you can't, right? There's no telltale sign of this. And so for the people at Ephesus, they are in need of reminding, again, of the nature of the work of the gospel and of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the calling that God has placed on their lives. That they, again once more, who were aliens to the commonwealth, have now become citizens of the commonwealth. And they become citizens of the commonwealth, not by any work of themselves, but because the Lord Jesus Christ has grabbed them off that wild olive tree and has grafted him upon himself. The root is holy and so are the branches. So what does it say there in verse 18 of Romans 11? Do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. And so brothers and sisters, undergirding a lot of what Paul is doing here at the end of chapter 1 and here in the middle of chapter 2 is reminding us again of the nature of our place in the kingdom and how we are to respond what's taken place in us by the hand of our God. Remember, at the beginning of chapter 1 uh, in the book of Ephesians, we are told, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Again, where does our holiness come from? Is our holiness born of our obedience to the commandments? Right? Do we gain merit through our keeping of the law? Do we gain merit through the sacrifices we give on the Lord's day? Does our merit come from the lighting of candles or from praying to the saints or doing good works? Well, our merit again comes from the fact that we have been united to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the seed, the one who is the root of Jesse. And our holiness, our righteousness is from him. And how are we to respond then here in the nature of this work? And in verse 6 of chapter 1 it tells us, To the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Again, this need to be reminded of where we are in the kingdom is because what is the old man within us trying to tell us constantly every day. Well, there's two things that the old man is trying to tell us to turn our eyes away from the foundation of grace. First of all, the old man is trying to tell you that you don't need Jesus' help. You don't need his help to do good works. You don't need his help to earn the love of God. You can do that on your own. And you can do that on your own, not only because you're a good person, but because you are wiser than God. And you have a better way to get to heaven than he does. 
And we see that traditionally in the Christian church by the way that man comes up with all kinds of new and interesting ways to worship the Lord their God. You go back and you read church history. It's, a, it's just one century after another of things being added to the worship of God. Until we get to the point where Antichrist is totally taken over uh, by the 7th and 8th century. And the worship of the average Christian church is nothing in comparison to what we see in the New Testament. And what's the, again, the, the attitude that brings us to that point? It's that we know more than God. And we can gain our way to heaven through the building of our own towers of Babel. And when we think about what we're here today doing, right, worshiping the Lord our God, sometimes people wonder why our worship is plain. Why we don't have a lot of smells and bells and I'm not wearing some kind of fancy get up. Why, why do we preach the word? Why do we sing the word? Why do we read the word? And why do we pray? We don't have you know, you know, times for dancing, right? We don't have plays. We don't have productions in our worship service. Why is that? Well, again, what has the word of God revealed unto us that we are to worship as God has called us to worship? That we don't have the right to kind of make up things that we think God would enjoy. Because when we do that, what are we really doing? We're making up things that we enjoy, right? that, 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 that we like doing. But that's not what the purpose of worship is, is it? And that's one of the reasons why when the Reformation took place, what was one of the first things that was done? Now Luther, in, in, his, in, in, his, uh, uh, in his goodness, uh, did not really do much when it came to removing the idols from the worship of God. It's one of the reasons why you walk into a Lutheran church and there's uh, you know, statues and there are uh, paintings of Jesus and, and it's very ornate in the lot. Because right? you know, Luther didn't do a whole lot of the Reformation work in worship. But why do you walk into a Presbyterian church and we have you know, white walls and we have you know, pretty windows. Nothing wrong with having pretty windows. But you know, the, the idea is, again, what is the focus of our being here? Our focus of being here is to focus on the word that God has given to us. Right? Resting in the revelation that God has revealed to us. Right? We don't need all of the flashy things. We don't need all of the production. We don't need all of that stuff because we're here to worship God, not ourselves. Right? We're not here to be entertained. We're not here to have our ears tickled. We're not here to have our eyes amazed at, at various things. We are here to hear the word of the Lord. And so that's why we preach the word. That's why we read the word. That's why we sing the word. Again, God in his simplicity wants everything taken away that will cause us to lose sight of the goodness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when he's speaking here to the Ephesians in, in Ephesians chapter 2, and he's wanting them to remember the nature of their redemption. That they who were once aliens have been made partakers of the covenants of grace. That they who are once uncircumcised have now been circumcised. Now remember something that uh, Paul says here. Who are called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. Now, does the Bible require in the new covenant men to be circumcised? No, it doesn't. You know, circumcision is wholly up to the, you know, the, the wisdom of uh, the, uh, the father and the family. You can be circumcised, be uncircumcised. It has no bearing upon your place in the kingdom. What has to take place? What does Moses say is really necessary? Is it the circumcision of the flesh or is it circumcision of the heart? In the book of Deuteronomy, uh, we hear uh, it witness to this. That what has to happen for the Israelite as well as for the Gentile is that their heart 
must not just be changed, but circumcised. And what was circumcision, remember, in the Old Covenant? It was a sign of your membership in the kingdom, right? In the covenant family, that you belonged unto the Lord. And so the circumcision of the heart, who sees the circumcision of the heart? Like God does. And, and, and again, we're not talking about a fleshly act, right? You know, the, the act of circumcision is not me opening your chest up and cutting a little piece of meat off of your heart. Right? What would happen if that's what was going on? Well, I'm, you know, those of y'all may have seen me with a knife know that that's not what the Lord's calling a was, right? I'm, that, that's not what the Lord has called ministers to do, to open your heart up and to cut it out. Right? That's the work of the Holy Spirit, right? It's a spiritual act where God marks you out as his covenant people. And again, this is one of the things that was causing such trouble, not just in Ephesus, but in Galatia, in Corinth, in, in Jerusalem, right? This confusion over the covenant sign of what it meant to be a member of this new covenant community. Did you as a Gentile need to have the mark placed upon you in order to be a Christian? And again, Acts 15 makes it abundantly clear that no, you don't have to have the outward mark. What do you have to have? You have to have the inward work of the Holy Spirit. You need to be called out of darkness and into the light of gospel truth. Your heart of stone needs to be changed to a heart of flesh. And so the Gentiles in Ephesus, they are being reminded, first of all, therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, right? You were uncircumcised Gentiles. You were outside the covenant. But what has happened? Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strange from the covenant of the promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once afar off, what has happened? You've been brought near by the blood of Christ, right? This washing of the blood, this being made new creatures in Christ and gets back to something else about the nature of the old man within you, right? Not only does he want you to find your own way to heaven, right, to create your own good works, right? Your merits that you might walk into heaven by your own power, but he also... On the other side, what does the old man within you do? He constantly is bringing up the sins that you have committed. He's constantly telling you that you are not able to be saved because you are a wicked and dark and evil sinner. When we read the word of God and we see the commandments that we have broken, the natural man within you, what does he do? He tries to drag you away from Jesus, right? He tries to drag you into the darkness of the cave. He tries to get you to doubt the goodness of God that he would save someone like you. So for the Gentiles, they need to be reminded of what? That they who were aliens to the covenant, they who were of the wild olive tree, those who were aliens to the covenant of promise are no longer aliens. And how are they no longer aliens? Is it because they walked to Jerusalem and went to the local county clerk in uh, Jerusalem and got their ID card that said they were now citizens of the people of God? Right? Is that how that happened? Well, of course that's not how that happened, right? That is a spiritual act by which the Holy Spirit, who has redeemed you from death and given you light in Jesus Christ, has given you the name which is above every name, that you now bear within your own soul the covenant sign of the living and the true God. And who can take that away from you? Of course, no one can take that away from you because God is the one who has given that to you, right? Man can give you citizenship, and what can man do? Man can take it away. Matter of fact, most of us here this morning are in the United States because somebody took our citizenship away from one of our grandparents and sent them across the sea. 
I know in my own family, the, the Glassers were once prominent citizens of Stuttgart in Germany. And they backed the wrong horse in the German War's reunification in the 1860s and were told to either go to jail or get out. And so they left everything that they had, left all the wealth, all the privilege that they had in the city. My whatever my great 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 grandfather was an alderman in the city of Stuttgart. And Stuttgart's not a small town. He was a wealthy man. He left everything in order to come here. Of course, ironically, he went to the um, went to Ellis Island and wasn't allowed in the United States. And so he went to Canada and then snuck across the border and ended up in Colorado. Now, he was quite literally an alien uh, to the United States. He was an illegal immigrant in, in, in a real sense. But he left everything that he had in Germany and came over here because man had taken his citizenship away from his home. And he had somewhere to go. Those of us who have left our former manner of life, who have left those wickedness and evils in our past, We've been brought into this covenant, not by the works of the flesh, not by the works of our hands, but by the sovereign act of the living and the true God. You know, and, like, and like most immigrants, my great-great-grandfather, after he came to the United States, served in the military, gladly because he saw the blessings of this nation. Even though he was an illegal immigrant, he gave himself to his new nation. Right? Because he, he saw, the again, not just the blessings, but the opportunity that had been provided to him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when we think about the nature of our own citizenship in heaven, should that not even more move us? Not just to, to give thanks for the goodness of God, for the goodness of God's grace, for the blessings that we have received, but think about the nature again of this union with Christ. If we are made partakers of this branch, right, of this root, of this new vine, what should we be? We are holy because he is holy. And this is a reminder that we need to hear fairly regularly that just because we have said with our mouths that we are members of the covenant does not make it so. Just because we've had the outward sign of the covenant placed upon us in baptism does not mean our heart has been changed. Again, if that's your trust this morning, if your trust this morning is that you are a faithful attender of worship or you are faithful because of the covenant that was made in, in, in your name when the waters of baptism were placed upon you, then you are lost. If your, your faith is based upon a, a word that you said many years ago as you walked an aisle or signed a card, then you are lost. Because what is true faith? Faith is not trust in the outward means of God's grace. True faith is resting and trusting in the inward work that has been accomplished for you in Jesus Christ. And 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. And again, this isn't a new problem, right? This isn't a new covenant problem. Israel fell because their faith was in Abraham and in Moses, Moses and Isaac and in Jacob. And their faith was not in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they looked back to those old uh, covenants of promise and thought as long as they were circumcised and as long as they took their goats and their sheep to the temple, that everything was okay. As we talked about in the uh, Sabbath school lesson this morning, what does God require? God requires mercy not sacrifice. In fact, what did he say of the sacrifice of the people of God in the days of Isaiah? That it stanketh his nostrils. Because it was not offered up in faith. It was offered up in duty. It was offered up because that's what good Jews did. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we think upon the nature of our place in the kingdom of God, we need to ask that question of ourselves. Are we doing things merely because we're Christians? 
especially as we decorate our homes this time of year, do we believe in Christmas or do we believe in Jesus Christ? And do we believe in the outward blessings of the season or do we believe in the Jesus who was born in Bethlehem? And do we worship the manger or the Christ child? And it's especially hard this time of year because, and you don't see this as much as you used to, but you know, if you, you, I'm sure you've heard the expression Christmas and Easter Christians. Like C&E Christians is what my parents always called them. Christians who were all about Jesus in December and in March and April. Right? Who loved to wear their love of Jesus on their sleeve. Right? Who, who decorated to the nines everything. And wanted everyone to know that they wanted to keep Jesus in Christmas and Christ the reason for the season. But how did they live January through March and then May through November? As the world lives, as pagans, as unbelievers. And of course, the Jews were good at that as well in the Old Covenant, right? They were faithful to go to the temple on the days. But what was Judah and Jerusalem like in the days of Isaiah? Like Sodom and Gomorrah. It was like the, the, the wickedest of times. Right? They were outwardly faithful. They were outwardly happy to do the things of God. But how does Jesus describe the Pharisees in Matthew 23? They were like whitewashed tombs. On the outside, beautiful, holy, everything looks wonderful, but inside, what are they full of? Dead man's bones. So brothers and sisters, as we, again, especially as we come into this season, as we think about what Paul has told us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, again, are we excited and joyful because of Christ and our being washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are we excited and joyful because of what has been accomplished to us in the Lord Jesus? And do we show that in the way that we live? Are we holy because the Lord Jesus is holy? Is our conversation saturated with grace? Do we speak as the world speaks or do we speak as Jesus speaks? Because again, we can't serve two masters. And the Lord Jesus sees through all of these outward obediences. And if you're a good Christian person in public and you go home and act like a sodomite, that what we're called to as Christians is not to be CNE Christians. We are called to be those who recognize our weakness and our inability, and those who recognize that we are to humble ourselves before the Lord our God, and that we're to rest in Him each and every day, and that we're to be blessed by the fact that we're no longer strangers. We are citizens of the kingdom. So let us rejoice and have joy in these things. Let us be thankful for the Lord our God. But again, let us make sure that we're doing them because of Christ. And because of the grace that he has showered upon us. For as Psalm 146, 5 tells us, Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. And this is the blessing of this citizenship that we have. This citizenship that it has come not by the works of the flesh, but by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. This free gift of faith. Let us rest, let us trust in it, and let us live in light of his goodness. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for the shed blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, to cleanse our conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. May our faith and our trust be in him. May it be in him every day of the year. May we long to be holy as Christ is holy. 
we might glory in him. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us stand as we sing our closing hymn, hymn number 203. Let us stand and rejoice. Now from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. Hear the word of the Lord. Be sober, be, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, set fast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen.